or books, um, our computers decided not to agree with us again this morning, so we'll just kick it old school, but we're here to worship, so let's sing together. We're going to sing of God's amazing grace this morning. He broke the power of sin and darkness. His love is mighty and strong. Let's sing this. This is amazing grace. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King of all. He shakes the whole earth. Who shakes the whole earth with all it thunder? In awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You your life that I would be set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me he brings our chaos back to the order who brings our chaos back into order a son and daughter, the King of glory, the King of all peace. Who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King of all peace. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Oh, 
Well, good morning. Good to see everybody. Welcome to the gathering. And I'm going to tell you, the longer I'm a Christian, the more amazing his grace is. Amen? The more each and every day I find myself struggling, the more wretched I seem to be, but the more graceful God is. God is, has amazing grace. Well, again, welcome. Y'all like this fall-like weather this morning? Isn't that great? Some of you guys probably had your windows open last night. So good morning, good morning. Glad to see everyone in the cool weather. Uh, just a quick uh, few announcements. One, cards for troops. All right, so I'm going to see who's going to write me a card uh, this week or this morning and send it to me. Uh, but also for all the other troops out there. Uh, you also, so the deadline is October 18th. Uh, so Labor Day is tomorrow. Office, office is closed. Uh, we have a week of prayer for Tennessee Missions, September 9th through the 13th. So the offering envelopes are in the welcome quarter for that. And you can join the worship team, this great team right here. Right, Aaron? Yes. So looking for more volunteers. And uh, so just a great morning. I want to welcome those that are watching by the way of internet. If you guys are watching on Facebook, just send us a message. Hey, where you're at, what you're doing. Maybe you have your coffee with you this morning and you're just excited to be uh, watching this virtually. But we're glad that you found us. Uh, we're glad that you're here. One more quick announcement to the uh, backpacks for Guatemala. They really just need monetary donations from here on out. So that would be greatly appreciated, monetary donations. All right, well, we have a special announcement that's going to be followed by our chairman of deacons, Bob Fife. And so I'm going to welcome Bob Fife if you want to come up here and uh, share that special announcement. Thank you, Justin. As many of you know, we at Central like to acknowledge and celebrate our pastor's uh, milestone years, five years, 10 years, 20 and it's hard to believe, but this is, the September 1st was the fifth anniversary for Tommy and Paula Hood. Can you believe it? So I've been asked to uh, write a letter of acknowledgement, so I want to share that with you uh, for just a few minutes. It's hard to believe that September 1st marked the fifth anniversary of our senior pastor here at Central Baptist Church. What an adventure it's been. <laughs> And it is with great joy and thanksgiving that we take a moment in our services this Sunday to celebrate this milestone. We were so blessed that had to have you and Paula join us at Central and transitioning from retiring pastor Ron Murray. And you and Ron worked together so seamlessly to make that transition seem uh, so natural, and we, we appreciate that so much. Um, you immediately embraced our church's mission-minded focus when you traveled to, with our team to Guatemala. Tommy, you quickly convinced those on that team that you were handy with tools as well as with words. When immediately upon arrival, your initial job was to help repair the out-of-service toilets. Uh, preaching three times each Sunday morning, I'm sure, has been a challenge for you as it would be for anyone. Uh, you have taken on that challenge with quiet determination, even to the point of preaching four times each Sunday morning for a few months this year. You have energetically ministered to all of our services in spite of the physical and emotional drain that such efforts require, and you have done it wonderfully, speaking the sometimes difficult truth with love. We are grateful for your leadership through Central's 150th year celebration last year. What a wonderful, unifying, and joyous event it was, in great part due to your thorough planning and leadership. You show a quiet strength and centeredness when dealing with difficult decisions and sensitive issues. Your grace and patience with those who disagree with you is exemplary. We are also blessed that you approach our personal losses with a genuine concern and sensitivity, showing a tireless compassion that only can be instilled by the work of the Holy Spirit. Paula, from the beginning, you have been a beautiful, refreshing voice of praise in our choir and a voice of healing, Christ-centered counsel through your work and your friendship. Even more evident to us is your calm, graceful person that accepts us where we are and brings into our relationships a joy of living and loving that is also evidence of a deep walk with Christ. Finally, we are very thankful for the steady, well-informed, and deliberate leadership you, Tommy, have displayed during this pandemic of uh, 2020. 
You maintain a scripturally sound and well-balanced approach to managing the many decisions, adjustments, and unforeseen issues that our church faces during this unique time. You continue to remain well-founded in faith, positive in attitude, and thoughtful in your approach as you lead us through these unsure days, weeks, and months. You never waver in seeking the truth revealed in God's word that is a lamp to our feet as we walk together through this difficult time. We pause today to celebrate the wonderful pastor, counselor, minister, and friend you have become over these past five years. We are so grateful to God for his providential care in bringing you and Paula our way. May he richly bless and protect you both as we walk together into the future that he has prepared for us. Congratulations on five years of service here at Central. So, um, I encourage you guys just to kind of look at the creation's beauty, you know. We're about to see some wonderful color, experience some wonderful weather. Um, so, it's just something. But before we start singing, I'm going to read a verse from Psalm 99, uh, 3 through 5. It says, Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. The King is mighty, and He loves justice. You have established equity. And Jacob, you have done what is just and right. Exalt the Lord our God and worship him at his footstool. He is holy. There's freedom in this place this morning to worship, both here and online. And we encourage you just to authentically worship God the way how you see fit. Um, sing loud, pray. I, this is a morning uh, for all of us to sing praises in his name. Let's do that together. Sing, we stand and lift our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down to worship Him. Yeah, it's 
sing holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Holy, holy. Holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Holy, holy. Just our voice.
thank, gosh, we thank you so much that you are Lord of all. And that our hope is built on you, the cornerstone. Because without, without that, everything else will fall down. But we know we build our faith on a firm foundation. And we know despite what's going on around the world, in our country, in our city, that you are Lord of all. Through this storm, our anchor is held within you. So God, we come this morning so thankful for the opportunity to sing and learn in your name. Lord, I pray that you speak to us and you distract or keep all distractions from us so that we can focus on you and your inspired word. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for being Lord of all. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, good to see all of you this morning on a beautiful weekend as the fall approaches. Thank you for four and a half wonderful years at this church and six months of... Uh, <laughs> uh, things have definitely been strange this year. But we're grateful to be able to gather together and worship the Lord in unity as brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, because of sin in the human heart, we live in a very broken and fractured world. Even before the pandemic came along, the news was full of conflict and violence from all around the globe. And here in the United States, now the Democrats and the Republicans are so polarized they can't seem to accomplish anything productive together, even in the midst of a crisis. They struggle to come together. And now, for the next eight weeks and two days, as we ramp up to the election, we're going to be bombarded by increasingly divisive rhetoric as each side demonizes the other and promises that we'll be saved only if we elect or re-elect them. But of course it isn't that simple. A good friend of mine is the editor of the Baptist Standard, the state Baptist newspaper in Texas. And in his editorial this week he wrote in part, the brokenness in the world is more complex than politics can solve especially in these days of polarized politics, if we could solve our brokenness in binary, either-or ways, our ongoing struggles would have been solved long ago. And there is truth in that. So instead of working together to solve our problems, we remain divided, forgetting that ultimately we're all on the same team. Unfortunately, it isn't just our nation that's divided either. Many churches are divided as well. Even in a church that enjoys as much unity as ours does. None of us knows how many marriages are troubled, how many homes are tense, or how many friendships are strained. But what we do know is that God wants us to be one with Him and with one another. Christ Himself prayed for our unity in His high priestly prayer in John 17. And how wonderful it is when unity happens. I think it would be good for us as we witness the deep divisions that surround us in our nation to look this morning at three beautiful truths about unity that we can find in the 133rd Psalm. I invite your attention with me this morning to Psalm 133. It's just three short verses, but they are beautiful verses. This passage is one of the Psalms of Ascents, as they are called. The Psalm that many believe the religious pilgrims would sing as they travel up to Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem for the various feasts and festivals that are so much a part of Jewish life. And this one, we're told, was written by David. So if you're able, I invite you to stand with me as I read God's Word for us this morning from Psalm 133, verses 1 through 3. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. It's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Thank you. Please be seated. And we see in this short psalm three truths about unity, that it is well-pleasing, it is sweet-smelling, it is life-giving. Here in this first verse, we see that it is good and pleasant. It is well-pleasing, we might say. One brisk Late November morning, an elderly man in Phoenix called his son in New York. He said, Jim, I hate to ruin your day, but I've got to tell you, your mother and I are divorcing. Forty-five years of misery is enough. Pop, what are you talking about, Jim says. His dad says, we can't stand the sight of each other any longer. We're sick of each other. And we're sick of talking about this, so you call your sister in Chicago and tell her. So frantically, the son calls his sister, who explodes on the phone. Oh, no, they're not getting divorced, she says. I'll take care of this. She calls Phoenix immediately. She yells at her father, you are not getting divorced. Don't do a single thing until I get there. I'm calling Jim back. We'll both be there tomorrow. Until then, don't do a thing. The old man says, okay. He hangs up. He turns to his wife. He says, okay. The kids are coming for Thanksgiving and paying their own way. Now what do we do for Christmas? Now I suppose mom and dad had a unity of purpose there that they were concealing from their children in order to get them to Phoenix. As we look at this text about unity, though, we we read in the King James Version where it says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Behold, I love that King James word. We don't use it much these days, but it, it grabs our attention. Behold, it's as if David, the psalmist, is saying, Hey, look here. Don't miss this. This is important. Take note. When people get along with each other, it's both good and pleasant. You know, there are a lot of things good that are not pleasant. In my experience, there are several things I would put in that category of good but not pleasant. Broccoli, for example. It's good, but to me, not pleasant. Lima beans, cauliflower, exercise. That's a good thing. We're supposed to do it. They tell us that, but I don't enjoy it. I've never gotten those endorphins, that that runner's high, whatever it is. I've never gotten that far. I don't know how far you have to run to get one of those, but I've never run that far. Those are good, but not pleasant. On the other hand, there are things that are pleasant that aren't good. Donuts, french fries, Coca-Cola, Lazy Boy. Those are all pleasant things, but not so good for us. But unity, the Bible tells us, is both good and pleasant. A double blessing, if you will. There's something morally good and emotionally pleasant about getting along with others. Not being at odds, but being unified. Suppose, for example, that two different families invited you to dinner on the same night. 
And you knew that one family was fighting among themselves and had been for some while. The other family, on the other hand, is happy and loving. Mealtimes there are always a joy. With which family would you rather eat? Suppose there are two different churches. And one church is always fussing and, and, and at odds with one another, and they have a reputation for it. But the other church is unified in purpose and, and, and mission, and, and they don't engage in those kinds of, of accusatory and, and, and divisive activities. Now, which church would you rather attend and be involved in and be a part of? It is good and pleasant to dwell together in unity. And we can do it too, as long as we remember one very vitally important thing. And that is, we can enjoy unity without having to have uniformity. And I trust that you know the difference between those words. We don't all have to look alike. We don't all have to think alike. We don't all have to share the same opinion in order to get along together and have unity, especially as brothers and sisters in Christ. That ought to be the hallmark of who we are in Christ. In fact, as a church, we are stronger when we experience a certain measure of diversity. We still hold fast to the bedrock truths of the faith. Obviously, we all have to believe that Jesus is Lord, that the Bible is true, that God expects obedience from us to the commands we find in His Word. Those are foundational. We share no identity if we don't agree on those things. But if we are teachable and can resist dogmatism and a rebellious spirit, we can learn from one another. We can grow much more rapidly in our faith if we can exercise respectful dialogue together around the Word of God. Then we can experience a good and pleasant unity without having to demand uniformity. It is good and pleasant when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. It is well-pleasing, but we find out in verse 2 that unity is also sweet-smelling, if you will. It's metaphorically like precious anointing oil upon the head, running down on the beard of Aaron, as the psalmist puts it. You know, in the Old Testament, God used the act of anointing with oil to symbolize the setting apart of certain people for divine service. And the oil is a sort of a, a, a picturesque way of, of, of portraying the Holy Spirit coming upon someone, sanctifying that person for holy use, setting them apart, as it were. God had instructed Moses, for example, to anoint Aaron as high priest using anointing oil in Leviticus. And Exodus 30 gives us a, a recipe for this perfumed oil. You may not be aware of that. It was made from five ingredients. Olive oil, liquid myrrh, cinnamon, cane, and cassia, which was a fragrance made apparently from tree bark. It all came together, was mixed together to make a sweet-smelling perfume. And as Aaron knelt before the Lord, Moses would have slowly poured this perfumed oil over his head. It ran down his beard. It saturated his clothing down to the fringes of his garments. It would have covered him with a pleasing, pleasant, unique aroma that would waft up, not just to the noses of those around him, but to God Himself. According to Psalm 133 here in verse 2, that's what the unity of God's people is like. In our day, that would be the unity of the church. When the church is unified, it is a sweet-smelling savor to our God who loves us, 
who called us out from among the masses to be his special treasure, his people. It's something the Holy Spirit does as he's poured out upon the church, saturating, drenching the people of God, making them one, bestowing on them a wonderful fragrance. And with that in mind, we have some instructions in the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 30 to 32, it says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. We're told not to grieve the Holy Spirit with whom we've been sealed or anointed, if you will. We're told to get rid of bitterness and rage and anger. And there's so much bitterness and rage and anger going on in the world around us. It, it, it's infecting those of us in the church if we, if we spend too much time uh, interacting with that, witnessing that, looking upon that. The things that the world has allowed to enrage them can infect us as well. And we can become enraged over things that should be nothing. We have to put that away. We're instead to be kind, forgiving each other. Why? Because we ourselves have been forgiven by God. A lot of people feel like they've been hurt, mistreated in some way by their parents perhaps, by a bully, by an employer, even by a church. Although I've learned over the years that that's more often a misunderstanding than it is a reality. But people feel that way. Well, God gives us the Holy Spirit to enable us to trust Him with those people that are making us angry, that are upsetting us. There comes a point when you say, Lord, you know what my parents did to me. Lord, you know what others are saying about me behind my back. Lord, you know how I was treated back in school, but Lord, you loved me enough to die for me, and I know you're big enough to settle things up for me. I'm going to leave it with you. That's a gift that God has given us to deal with the things that we think ought to be changed, ought to be different. Uh, with those who have wounded us or hurt us, we can leave it alone and let God deal with it. One of the best cures for anger is trust in Christ. And one of the things the Spirit does is He gives us the wisdom we need to trust Christ with things that might otherwise enrage us and drive us to the streets. Unity is well-pleasing, unity is sweet-smelling. But unity, finally, is also life-giving. Life-giving. It's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. You know, we need moisture for, for life. We need it in our own bodies. We need it in the world around us. Things... Places that get moisture thrive and, and grow. Places that don't struggle for it. You know, you may not uh, know what this is, so I'll explain it to you. In Texas, they have these things they call rain gauges. Now, they're, they're little tubes with markers on them. In one inch, two inch, three inches. Although, rarely do they need more than an inch. And everybody has one. And the topic of conversation on Sunday morning, if, if any moisture has fallen through the week, is how much do you get? Well, I got two-tenths. How much do you get? I got three. Because they don't get a lot of rain in Texas. When we moved to Tennessee, we brought our rain gauge with us. We put it out in the yard and soon discovered nobody has a rain gauge in Tennessee because we don't need it. You know, one of my Facebook friends from Texas posted a picture 
uh, on, on Facebook this week of his rain gauge with five inches of rain in it. And he was rejoicing. And here in Tennessee, we call that Tuesday. Or at least East Tennessee. You know, the, the, the moisture, we had a guy in my church back then on Wednesday nights at prayer meeting. His prayer request was always for rain. Put rain, on, put it on there every week. We need rain, we need rain, we need rain. Because moisture is essential. And this scripture tells us that's what unity is like. It's life-giving. It is if the dew of Hermon, Mount Hermon, you know, this is the original mountain dew. We like to claim that Mountain Dew got its start here in East Tennessee, but really this is the origin of it. The dew on Mount Hermon. That mountain is the highest mountain in Israel in the far north part of the country. The moisture from it would run down into streams and rivulets that would flow into the Jordan River, that north-south river that runs through the Holy Land. And they would, they would drain water from it to irrigate their their, uh, their plants and to, to bring life. It was a very meaningful metaphor to them. And that's what the unity of the Spirit does. It gives life. A united marriage. A united friendship. A united church. Especially a united church gives life to others. And one that is divided has no life to give. Unity it is well-pleasing, it is sweet-smelling, it is life-giving. It's a prized and precious thing, but it's not automatic. And it's not easily achieved. It takes work. Sometimes it takes an extraordinary something to break down the barriers that divide us. Back in 2002... A Palestinian baby was abandoned at birth in a roadside trash heap. The baby was rescued by Palestinian doctors, nurtured by a group of Catholic nuns, had her heart repaired by an Israeli surgeon. Now, if you know the history of that area, you know how divided those peoples are. The violence between Palestinians and Israelis has cost the lives of infants and children as well as adults through the years and over time. This baby was given the name Salam. It means peace in Arabic. And this was a rare example of that region's usually fractured and and clashing peoples working instead together to save a life. Baby Salam was found by Palestinians along a road north of the West Bank town of Ramallah, taken to a shelter run by Palestinian social services. A group of nuns in Bethlehem gave her a permanent home, but the baby's health declined. She failed to thrive. She had been born with a large hole between the chambers of her heart. Her lungs weren't receiving enough blood. The Palestinian doctors noticed that she was turning blue, losing weight, so they took the baby to a hospital in Jerusalem. She was skin and bone, and that's it, said Israeli doctor Eli Milgalter, who operated on Salam's heart on January 24th of 2002. The Catholic nuns raised nearly $11,000 to pay for the hospital costs. Dr. Milgalter performed the surgery without accepting any payment. And baby Salam, because of the cooperation and the unity of those differently minded groups of people, not only survived, but made a full recovery. And they began to call her the peace baby. 2,000 years ago, there was another baby born in Palestine. In Bethlehem, to be precise. And it was his mission to bring unity. Unity between God and humanity, first of all. And unity between brothers and sisters under God as a natural outgrowth of that unity that we find in Him. 
in Christ, we can have unity with our Creator, the one who breathed the breath of life into us at the very start. In Christ, we can have that relationship repaired and rebuilt if we will trust in Him. And in Christ, we can learn to recognize just how much God has done for us and so extend grace and forgiveness to one another and experience the unity that God desires for us in our church, in our nation, in our world. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, your word speaks again and again of how good and pleasant it is to be unified together. Not uniform. We can be distinct from one another. We can have differing opinions, even radically differing opinions on certain things and still experience the unity that you desire for us, that Christ prayed for us. And God, I, I pray this morning that you would open our eyes to see how good and pleasing it is to experience that unity, that we might recognize what you have done for us to redeem us, and that we would implement that redemption in our lives and work toward the redemption of our culture and our world so that we can experience all that you intended for us when you created us. God, make it so in our hearts, in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing together a, a song of response to give you opportunity to reflect on how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. And if you don't know what it means to be unified in your relationship with God, through Jesus Christ, I invite you after the service concludes to meet me out under the drive through in front of the church in the open air where we can converse safely and, and openly about whatever it is God is putting on your heart this morning. I hope you'll think about that, reflect on that, take action if you need to. Let's stand to our feet now as we're led in singing. You think of all God's done for you.
sing this together. I will build my life. can't think of a better time than now. This country, God's church, to be unified. Thank you, Dr. Hood. I'll just leave you with these great two verses, the benediction. May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other, as is fitting for followers of Jesus Christ. Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have a blessed week. Take care. God bless you. We are dismissed.